Okay. Uh, welcome to this uh, AWS Lambda and Sumo Logic Observability Workshop. Um, could you advance the slide, please? My name is Tim McDonald. Uh, I am the Director of Partner Architects at Sumo Logic, and I've had 20 years in the industry uh, and six years at Sumo Logic, uh, both enabling and onboarding uh, partners and customers. Uh, today, uh, we're joined by uh, Dilip Rajan and Vinay Maddy from uh, AWS, as well as Rishi uh, Divare from uh, Sumo Logic. Uh, Dilip, would you like to introduce yourself? Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, Dilip Rajan. I am a partner solutions architect at AWS. I work very closely with our partners in the data and analytics ecosystem. Sumo Logic is an uh, advanced partner of ours, and I've been working with them very closely over the last uh, couple of years. I'm happy to be a part of this workshop and help you through uh, an overview of Lambda. Vinay? Hello, everyone. Glad to be here today. Vinay Madhi, Senior Solutions Architect at AWS. I joined AWS close to 18 months back, but before that, I have used Lambda in my previous roles at GE and other startups. I've been a backend engineer all my life with focus on distributed systems, application development, IoT, and blockchain. Thank you. Thanks, and Rishi. Rishi, you're muted. Okay, well, maybe Rishi has uh, had to step away. So Rishi's a principal technical product manager here at Simologic. Uh, and he'll be joining us a little bit later to speak about uh, the Sumo Logic uh, solution. In the meantime, uh, could you pre present the next slide, please? So the agenda today is that Dilip and Vinay are going to talk about uh, AWS Lambda and some of the some of the features and, and newer newer developments with AWS Lambda. Uh, Rishi will then discuss the Sumo Logic partnership with AWS and how our uh, Lambda integrations work. And then at the end, uh, I will uh, present two workshops, uh, both regarding Lambda, one for logs and metrics, and the other uh, for distributed tracing. And then at the end, we will have a Q&A session. Uh, if you do have questions in the meantime, uh, feel free to put them into the chat and we will attempt to answer them as they come in via chat. Uh, but you're also welcome to wait until the end, uh, depending on time. And with that, uh, I'll go ahead and hand this over to you, Dilip. Hey, uh, thanks, Tim. Um, so in this part of the presentation, I'll uh, hopefully not take too much uh, time from the workshop uh, so we can sort of focus more on the on the on how Soma operates. But I want to give you uh, give everybody an overview of Lambda, including some of the recent features and capabilities, um, uh, so that you know we have the right context for the for the workshop that uh, Tim will present later on. So at a high level, really, Lambda is a serverless compute service, right? That lets you run your code without you know uh, provisioning or managing servers. Uh, and Lambda runs your code on a high availability compute infrastructure, performs all the administrative tasks, uh, including like server maintenance, you know, auto scaling, provisioning, um, you know, uh, logging and monitoring. So, you know, with, with the, you know, you can focus more on development of the code uh, and, and literally uh, a Lambda can run on any of the backend services uh, of an application. So all you need to do is to provide your code in one of the application runtimes uh, that uh, Lambda uh, supports and provides. So uh, certainly, I, we think we can we can provide you a color and overview of that. Some of the use cases that we will talk about uh, as a part of the agenda includes uh, you know uh, includes use cases that will be covered in the Lambda fundamentals. We also talk about some of the other capabilities in concurrency scaling optimizations as well as some of the newer capabilities that Vinay will take over towards the later half of this uh, presentation. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about some of the use cases uh, as far as Lambda is concerned. Um, so if you think about uh, Lambda, it can be triggered uh, using a data processing framework, or it could be uh, with, with a stream analytics framework through Amazon Kinesis, or it could be um, specifically used for uh, at scale for your uh, application backend, right? Um, but in, in terms of uh, a serverless application, all we need is uh, the application code 
in one of the following runtimes. Uh, and you could also have some custom runtimes as long as you are able to uh, provide a format uh, of the of the of the of the runtime. Uh, and most runtimes with the Linux are pretty much supported as far as uh, Lambda functions is concerned. But once you provide the application code, the next step is really uh, how does it get triggered or how does a function invocation take place, right? Um, so we can think about that in terms of a change of state of a uh, you know of a data source, for example, a Dynamo TV stream or a Kinesis uh, stream that uh, triggers an event. Uh, subsequently, you could also think about it from a, a standard pattern that we see all the time, which is API gateway to Lambda, uh, or uh, you know when an object is being uploaded or deleted in an S3 uh, bucket. You know, all of these things can create a function invocation and eventually uh, create a subsequent action on the basis of what the application function is supposed to perform uh, from, a, from a backend perspective, right, really. Uh, let's let's move on to some of the uh, some of the you know comparisons with other AWS services in terms of compute. Uh, at the at the bottom, you obviously see Amazon uh, EC2. Then you know as you go further up the stack, you see ECS, Fargate, and then Lambda. Really, the benefit in terms of an operational responsibility is that all you need to need to do from a uh, Lambda perspective is to focus on building the application code, and AWS does all of the sort of undifferentiated heavy lifting. Um, and, and you know you're only responsible for managing your code itself, right? Uh, we also want to talk a little bit about some uh, cost considerations as far as uh, Lambda is concerned. Um, essentially, Lambda scales to zero, and what that really means is you only pay for uh, what you use. So it's, it's truly cloud native in that sense. Um, and with the latest advancements, we've uh, been able to bill customers at one millisecond intervals. And really, there's no need to pay for patching or maintenance. So, so from that perspective, uh, certainly Lambda has a lot of value. And let's talk a little bit about the execution models. The, the first execution model is a synchronous model, which is very similar to your HTTP world, right? You create a, a HTTP request and wait for a response. Very, very common pattern that we see uh, in, in the old HTTP world. Right? Uh, we, we also talk, think about the asynchronous uh, model where you know, Amazon SNS or S3 uh, can trigger an event um, and that event doesn't need to wait for a response, right? It's a fire and forget type of an approach. Uh, and then finally, of course, we have the stream or a polling based approach where Lambda polls a data source, uh, for example, a Kinesis endpoint or a DynamoDB um, a stream. And then um, uh, the, the, the batch events can be further triggered to another Lambda. I also want to talk to you about, well, these are just some examples of uh, some of the uh, trigger points, but in, in a sense, you know, it, Lambda integrates across a variety of uh, sources uh, and services within AWS, including, you know, data stores, configuration repos, like, uh, you know, CloudFormation, CloudTrail, or uh, across endpoints uh, and even event uh, messages, services, including event bridge. Uh, so that way, you know, you have a flexibility of how you want to integrate Lambda across your AWS landscape. Um, so in terms of, uh, you know, some of the features, I want to talk about concurrency and scaling. Um, so, you know, concurrency is important because it, it's, not, it's not just about the number of requests that you're handling, but it's the number of requests you're handling at one given time, right? Um, so why, why this is important is when, uh, when your function is invoked, an instance is allocated to process that event, right? And there are only so many instances that can be handled and as a function of a regional quota, um, the number of functions and the concurrency across the number of functions is limited to that to that particular region. So it's important to uh, take concurrency into mind, uh, and uh, we want to establish that uh, concurrency because of its limits. Uh, we are we are managing for concurrency. So this is a this is a sort of a knob that you have to control uh, how your Lambda function operates. Uh, let's talk a little bit about concurrency in detail. Right, like really, it's uh, transactions per second. Uh, times the duration. So if you have 100 transactions per second, it takes about 100 milliseconds and the concurrency is essentially 50. Uh, similarly, if you have 100, but it takes two, maybe two seconds and the concurrency is 200. Like really what we are trying to get to is the fact that lower concurrency is better. And, uh, and, and, and in a sense that uh, low, lower duration is also better uh, because as far as the regional quota is concerned, uh, it needs to be shared across multiple functions and, and maintaining a lower concurrency is really important. But there are some benefit, some, some sort of techniques which are available uh, within a Lambda that allow you to, uh, that allow you to sort of care for uh, concurrency, which is provision concurrency 
And this feature helps with uh, initialization of a function. And for, uh, for like a hyper ready type scenario where you're, you're looking for a very latency sensitive application, such as uh, you know, web or mobile backends uh, or, or synchronous APIs. So for those type of situations uh, and to take care of this cold start scenario where you're provisioning instances from the front, from the start, you, you don't have to worry about that by setting a, a basic floor in terms of concurrency, right? So it's already, already a pre-boomed environment. On the other hand, you know, what ends up happening is if you don't have a ceiling, your 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 um, your your lambda functions can be uh, can can sort of run start running amok, and you know you'll have a huge number of uh, uh, events being invoked if there is an unplanned uh, a large scale event that takes place for you. So in that case, uh, you could run out of your quota and, um, and sort of uh, have no contingency. So for that purpose, you know it'll be better to have reserved concurrency, uh, and it helps you throttle uh, the number of invocations. Uh, for your event, right? Uh, so as uh, till this, I've uh, covered some of the you know basic fundamentals of Lambda and, and provide you some concurrency controls. Uh, I'll hand it back, hand it to uh, Vinay to take you through some of the advanced uh, features, including Lambda layers, optimizations, and other, uh, other uh, fun fun activities. Vinay, thanks, thanks, Dilip. Yeah, I'm going to talk about some of the optimizations uh, within Lambda. There are a bunch of ones, but I'm just going to take two topics here, which are a little bit recent ones and talk about layers and container images. So for Lambda layers, anyone developing code, right? I mean, there is always this common set of functionality you want to share across, right? Today you are developing a bunch of services, you have shared library code, something like that. But how do you do that in a serverless environment? The solution is uh, Lambda layers. Layers is a way to allow functions to share code. If you have different functions that have some common functionalities, example, like data access code, logging, or any basic utilities you want to share, Lambda layers is a great way to share that code and not have to bake it into every single function. And you manage these layers independently, which again promotes faster development cycles. What components you can use layers for, uh, for modul modularizing? I would say examples are libraries, custom runtimes, data, and any configurations. There is built-in support for secure sharing. Uh, what it really means is when you create a layer, you create you create it to be private to your AWS account, but you have controls that you can use to optionally share the layer with other accounts or make it public as well. Next slide. Yeah, there are certain limits you should be aware of. Um, the ones are the basic ones are here. You can have five layers per function. Uh, and the order of those layers are very important. For example, layer two is dependent on layer one. Then layer one should be <clears throat> the first one to load and then layer two. So the way you have to think about this is more like people coming from the container world, right? Like a Docker file, every line in Docker file, and this have a layered file system at the end of the day. You can have versions for every layer. For example, uh, layer one can have a couple of versions, version one, two, three. And you can choose to have different functions use different versions of that uh, layer. And vice versa is possible as well. What it means is like a function with version two can use a layer one of version three. So any combination is possible. Uh, the size of the function along with layer should be less than 250 MB. All right. The next one, container images. It's a fairly recent feature. Uh, yeah, next slide where we are saying you can not only upload your function code in the .zip format, but also use the container image support for changing the uh, packaging formats, right? Anything around compliant with OCI. The main advantage with this is you can use your same consistent or same set of tools for containers and Lambda-based applications. The other thing you have seen earlier is the limit around 250 MB, right? Now you can upload fairly large images around 10 gig is supported. And you still get the benefits of the serverless subsecond automatic scaling, high availability, native integrations with a bunch of AWS services and paper use billing model. One thing you have to uh, remember uh, is when you deploy between, what is the difference between .zip and the container image format, right? So the life cycle is a little bit different for container image. So when you deploy code as a container image to a Lambda function, the image undergoes an optimization process for running on Lambda. This process typically takes a few seconds during which the function is in pending state. And when whole of this optimization process completes, the function enters active state. That's when it's ready to be triggered and take the request or handle transactions. All right, uh, next. 
this is the last topic i'm going to touch upon today so typically you're all running it's all serverless right but how what mental model you have to carry when you're running this lambda execution environment so here he uh, dilip is sharing here so when you upload the code you're always on the right side the runtime plus function right this is what you are really taking care of yeah you are uploading your runtime and your function and then what else is happening in that environment so the mental model you want to carry is for one request let's say you have two requests coming at the same time and you want two instances of lambda so on the right side whatever you have the execution environment in this big rectangle dotted box you will have two instances of that if you have 100 requests coming and let's say your concurrency factor is 100 Okay, I know they touched upon the concurrency topic briefly. So you will have almost 100 instances of this execution environment. And this execution environment gives you some a flexibility to augment the behavior of your functions. And those are these extensions API, runtime API, and logs API. Most of the times, the uh, people live in this runtime plus function code, but you can always tap into this APIs to augment the behavior of your functions. One function which is executing one time will have this whole setup on the right. If you have two functions, again, you have two things, right? So can you go to the next slide, Abdul? So typically the way the, this whole thing happens is, yeah, init is the one where you initialize the functions. You, you, we have three sets, three phases there. First, the extensions are in our init, then runtime, then the function. Then the, for the entire runtime is the execution environment is created and it is ready to handle requests. Then you can invoke multiple times, then the shutdown happens. Coming to the use cases for different APIs, right? Uh, yep. Before going to the extensions API, we also have runtime APIs, which is essentially a HTTP API for custom runtimes to receive invocation events from Lambda and uh, send response data back with the Lambda execution environment. Extensions API is one of the critical things we have released recently where extensions can register for lifecycle events. You can write logic to involve in all three phases of Lambda execution, initialization, invocation, shutdown. Then you use these extensions to integrate Lambda with your preferred tools for monitoring, right? I mean, case in point, Sumo logic here. Logs API, on the next slide. Logs API, Lambda automatically captures all the runtime logs, whatever you sys out, right, into CloudWatch. This log stream contains the logs that your function code and extensions generate, and also the logs that Lambda generates as part of the function invocation. Lambda extensions API can also use runtime's logs API to subscribe to log streams and directly use within the Lambda environment. That's it from my side. Um, over to Rishi. Thank you, Vinay. Thank you, Dilip. So uh, now let's talk about how Sumo Logic has partnered with AWS. Next slide. So Sumo Logic has been a committed AWS partner since we founded the company in 2010. And today we're proud to be part of various AWS competency programs, partner programs, and service validations, including the Lambda Ready service validation. So this partnership gives us strong alignment with AWS product teams and we, we've had the privilege to participate with AWS as a launch partner for several new AWS services and features. Okay, next slide. So now let's talk about Sumo Logic's observability capabilities for AWS Lambda. Okay, next slide. So we have multiple capabilities for you to get complete observability of your, of your AWS Lambda functions. So the first thing is we have support for ingesting critical telemetry data which include logs, metrics, traces, and we can do so via special Sumo Logic collector sources, Lambda functions, and Lambda extensions. So we'd, I'd also like to point out that we have CloudWatch logs and metric sources based on Kinesis Firehose for faster performance and better pricing models on the AWS side. And then we have a special Lambda app in the Sumo Logic app catalog that has out of the box dashboards to help you monitor the health and performance of your Lambda functions. And then thirdly, we have the Sumo Logic AWS Observability Solution that provides a framework to simplify the ingestion and anal analysis of data from multiple AWS services, including Lambda. So we have out-of-the-box dashboards and alerts specially built for AWS Lambda that help you navigate across AWS account and region hierarchies. And Tim is gonna run through some of these in the next sections of this presentation. We go back. Um, can you go back, uh, Philip? Yeah, 
So we also, the solution, AWS Observability Solution also has a root cause explorer add-on that helps your on-call staff, DevOps, and infrastructure engineers accelerate troubleshooting for production incidents in your applications and microservices running on AWS, including AWS Lambda. Okay, so we have just, just uh, for information, we have a spotlight session and also a breakout session on AWS Observability in the Illuminate platform. And then finally, we have tracing visibility into your Lambda functions. So you have end-to-end -end visibility of all your transactions that involve, that include Lambda calls, right? So with that, now I'm gonna pass it back to Tim to walk, through, uh, walk us through the rest of the workshop. Thanks, Rishi. <clears throat> Let me go ahead and share my screen. And hopefully you, everybody can see that. So today we're gonna go through two lab activities. Uh, the first one is uh, going to be around using logs to troubleshoot Lambda. And uh, what we're gonna do is I'll take you through briefly what the exercise will consist of. And then um, we will uh, allow you to log into a training environment and follow along as I go through this with uh, this exercise in the product. So if you would like to follow along in, in the training environment, um, now is probably the time to fire up uh, another tab in your web browser or, or something along those lines so that you can log in in a moment. But first, let's just go over what the general flow of this, work, of this uh, exercise is going to be. So, um, for the purposes of both of these exercises, we are going to be assuming the role of um, a support or a software engineer or DevOps engineer that uh, is responsible for a production environment for a coffee application. And that coffee application is the Sumo Logic coffee bar, which you can see on the screen. It's a lovely application from which you can uh, purchase uh, not only coffees, but, but more recently we have added a pastry menu. So both of these, uh, both of these features are um, reflected in the exercises that we're about to do. Uh, so the first one, going back to the slide deck, we've been alerted that the end users are experiencing an outage in the coffee app. Uh, within the US East one area in the last 24 hours. Uh, we've gotten an alert via whatever mechanism it, it is that um, you know, we, uh, we've set up, whether that's email or, or some sort of ticketing system or a Slack or a t Microsoft Teams. Uh, and now that we have the alert, we need to take a look and see what potentially could have caused this problem. And so we are going to leverage the Sumo Logic Observability Solution uh, along with uh, logs and metrics uh, within that solution to uh, understand uh, what the cause of this is and, and hopefully find the culprit that, that, that made this happen. So the first step will be accessing the observability dashboards through what we call the Explorer view. And uh, we'll walk through this and we'll identify potentially uh, which Lambda function uh, was, is failing. And then using this same view, we will focus in on that Lambda function and understand a little bit more about what it is that um, is potentially uh, failing specifically. And then we will deep dive into the log data to understand um, more information about uh, who potentially could have uh, made the configuration changes uh, that caused this outage. So uh, now is the time. If you would like to follow along in the training environment, uh, the URL for the training environment is service.sumologic.com. And uh, I believe Rishi is also pasting this into the chat. So it will be there uh, in the future, regardless of whether I've moved off this slide or not. Uh, when you log in, please log in as training plus analyst. 
and then use three numbers anywhere between 001 and 999 at sumologic.com. So um, you do actually need to substitute the, the numerals for those pound signs. If, if you can't use training plus analyst pound, pound, pound. And the password is September 2021 uh, exclamation mark. And that is case sensitive. So the capital, the S is capital. Uh, and then um, when you're when you're logged in, if you would, please just put your number into the chat so that we uh, know that you've used that one. Um, I see that you guys are following along, so I appreciate that. Uh, also, Rishi has uh, put a exercise uh, document in PDF form, a link to it in the chat as well. So uh, if you get lost or, um, you know, I go too fast for you, you can reference that as well. All right, so it looks like uh, we have quite a few people logged in. Uh, again, if you have problems, please uh, reach out in the chat and somebody will help you. In the meantime, we're going to go ahead and move forward with the exercise. So I'm going to switch over to the live environment. Uh, this is the SumoLogic Continuous Intelligence Platform. And uh, your, your login may or may not look the same as mine. Um, because these are shared user accounts, you, there may be a bunch of tabs along the top that uh, are already open from a previous user. That's fine. If you, if you want to close them, uh, you can right click and, and there will be a pop up that says close all tabs. Uh, the important thing, uh, regardless of whether you close those tabs or not, is that you find this new button, which will be along the top of the environment somewhere. And you will want you to click that new button. And we're going to, for this first exercise, we're gonna open up the Explorer view. So we're gonna do new Explorer. And when we click on that new Explorer, we get a new tab. Uh, this is going to consist of the Explorer itself, which is a hierarchical view on the left-hand side, and then the dashboards on the right. Uh, and what we're going to be presented with at the very top, it says Explore By. Uh, you should get AWS observability, but there's other um, there's other types of explorers that are available, as you can tell. Uh, there's Kubernetes, there's user monitoring. Uh, those are for other workshops. So today, if you're not on AWS observability in the Explore By dropdown, please select AWS observability. Um, once, uh, once you've selected that, then you should be presented with a screen that looks very similar or identical to mine. Uh, each one of these items or entries below the Explorer view here uh, represents an AWS account. So we know that I believe the average number of AWS accounts for any given customer, I think the average number is 56, but, but you know, the best practice is to have one AWS account per product lifecycle stage. Um, so you have, there are, there are customers out there that have hundreds and hundreds of accounts. So the Explorer is designed to provide an easy access to all of your accounts uh, for the purposes of observability and for understanding these accounts. Um, for the purposes of today, we are going to go to the prod account because this is the production uh, instance of the Sumo Logic coffee bar that we are managing. And we are going to US East one. And so this is uh, because our alert uh, you, if you'll recall, uh, said that the outage was in US East 1. So upon <coughs> clicking, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> upon clicking on US East 1, we may need to refresh. Uh, so, uh, and the dashboards will populate at the very, we're at the very top level of US East 1. So this is giving us a dashboard um, that is populated with a variety of information coming from a variety of different AWS services. <clears throat> if yours is not populating like mine uh, didn't, uh, you can in the top right hand corner, click the refresh dashboard uh, button, which will reload all of these panels and, and hopefully resolve that issue. Uh, and, and as I mentioned, each one of these sets of panels represents a different AWS service. 
Uh, as you can see, there's quite a few here. There's Load Balancer, API Gateway, EC2, Lambda, which we'll be focusing on today, um, you know, and others. So the, um, the data that's represented here <clears throat> is uh, going to be a combination of derived from a combination of both, both metrics in the form of uh, CloudWatch, CloudWatch metrics from various CloudWatch namespaces. Uh, as well as log data. So for instance, uh, this activity overview, uh, incoming active locations, that's going to be CloudTrail derived, whereas something like this Lambda errors is going to be Lambda, Lambda metrics uh, from the, the Lambda CloudWatch uh, metrics namespace. And <clears throat> what we're seeing here is that we've had an increase in errors. We have a significant number of errors and it's on the rise. And we also see uh, a chart showing our invocations. Uh, but this is fairly high level information. We want to drill down into this. So we're going to come down to the Explorer view and come into the Lambda namespace. And when we click on that, uh, we will get a Lambda specific dashboard. Uh, so we are no longer looking at a high level overview, but we are looking more very specifically at um, Lambda metrics and uh, Lambda uh, log data. And so <clears throat> there's a few things I'll point out here. Uh, we have that invocation information again available to us here, as well as invocation duration, throttling, uh, and uh, errors. And you can see that we have had some spikes in our errors uh, over the course of the last 24 hours. Uh, we also have you know, top functions and top users as well as uh, the color locations. Uh, but we're here to troubleshoot a very specific problem, which is why is our coffee shop service down? And the coffee shop service depends on Lambda invocations. So if we come down here and look at our successes and failures, uh, we'll see that uh, we have a significant number of errors or what appears to be a significant number of errors. Uh, and the majority of those seem to be coming from this function, get billing info. Now, you know, we really aren't, we don't really know if this number is significant or not because we don't have context for it just yet. Um, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna come down here and look at successes versus failed requests to get some context. So you can see the failures are in light blue and the successes are in dark blue. We can in fact just click on these just to see one or the other. Uh, we see that our get billing info has a significant number of failures, 720. And when we look at successes, we see that the get billing info has none, no successes. So this is in fact a problem, uh, assuming that this is a, a critical function, which it is. So um, this is giving us the info we need to really st start to hone in on the problem. It, it's looking like this get billing info function is what's calling it, causing our outage. So um, next step, you know, let's let's try to uh, sort of zoom in on this get billing info function. And the way that we're going to do this is we're going to uh, filter this entire dashboard based on function name, and we can do that up here at the top. And you'll see that we've already actually filtered the dashboard on some level, and that was done automatically for us over here on the Explorer view. So when we clicked into uh, prod, it, it added this prod filter. When we clicked into US East one, it added a region. And when we clicked into Lambda, it added a namespace. So we're gonna go ahead and uh, add the get billing info uh, function as the function name that we wanna filter on. And when we do that, uh, you'll notice that the dashboard redraws, right? And everything now within this dashboard is specific to that function. So we can see the colors of that function we can see the errors of that function. Yes, there's a big spike there. Uh, we can see the invocation times and the durations and all of this sort of thing. Uh, and more interestingly, we can see what the function operations, how those break down. And so we can see that there's four, um, four different uh, types of events that are coming out of this function. Um, these invoke and list function seem to be fairly uh, standard. But we have two others here, update function configuration and update function code. Uh, we're going to go ahead and look at the update function configuration uh, and see uh, where that leads us. But to do that, what we really want to find out is like who is responsible. We want to pin this to 
hopefully uh, either an automated process or an individual uh, that may have made these configuration changes. Uh, so to do that, we need to look a little deeper and we need to do that in the actual log data. Uh, so up until now, we've we've been leveraging both metrics uh, from the CloudWatch namespace as well as log data to get a, a pretty good idea of what's causing our outage. But now we need to deep dive into the log data to find uh, the, the sort of the raw information <clears throat> that will lead us to uh, the source of the problem. So to do this, we're going to click on the ellipsis in the top upper right hand corner. And we're going to click on open in search. And this will bring up a new tab uh, at the top of the screen, which is the most frequent function. And you'll see the output is the same. It's the same as what we saw in the panel. Uh, up here, we have the actual query that was what was defining the contents of that panel. Uh, we don't have to mess with the query today. So uh, we're just going to look at the output. The output is um, this, this column here, event name. We need to remember that. That's the field that contains this, this information. Uh, and what we want to do is we want to filter by this field name. Um, so we're going to go into the raw log messages, and we're going to remember event name. And over here on the left, we're going to see the event name field. We're going to click on it. And this will show us a statistical breakdown of the different potential values of this field in the log data. So as the log data comes in, the, the fields get parsed out, and then Sumo Logic gives us uh, the statistics for the different values uh, that, are, that are showing up in this, this particular field. And update function code is one of those. And if we click on it, or sorry, update function configuration. If we click on it, this will add a filter for us to the output. And we will now, see, you see that we're getting only four results back. Oops, only the four results back. And this is um, all log entries. And if you were to slide all the way over to the right, you'll see the actual uh, original log message. <clears throat> Everything to the left are different fields that have been parsed out. And most specifically, what we're looking at here is this assumed role user field that shows that this user, Mark Smith, appears to be the one that has uh, triggered these, these up configuration update events, and that this is the person that we should go uh, talk to about you know, ad addressing this, this outage and, and to see you know, what configuration changes Mark has made. Clearly, they're incompatible with our production environment. And so that is the, uh, the first exercise. Uh, hopefully, you guys were able to follow along for those of you that, that wanted to. Uh, and so let's sort of recap what we did. First of all, <clears throat> we took a look at our Lambda environment for US East 1. We drilled into the Lambda namespace. We um, looked at the errors that were coming out of Lambda. We figured out that Git Billing Info was failing. And then once we knew that information, we found the events for that particular Lambda function. Uh, and we filtered on those events, and that led us to the raw log data that contained the user, uh, Mark Smith. So we were able to do all of this using a combination of metrics, um, which sort of showed us where the fire was, and then logs, which, which took us to the, the, the actual uh, root cause. So the next uh, lab is tracing. And so this is going to leverage um, the other component of observability, which is tracing. So, you know, metrics are great for sort of high level indicators of problems. Um, logs are excellent for finding the cause. Uh, tracing uh, is the last, you know, the last component of observability, which, you know, is transaction monitoring, right, uh, at, at its core. And so, you know, basically in a modern environment, you know, any user request to a service or application uh, has a potential variety of different paths it can go through uh, when you're talking about modern applications built on, you know, distributed microservices based uh, architectures. And any component of that path could cause a performance hit or, an out or a failure if that component is, is not configured and functioning properly. 
Uh, so distributed tracing uh, allows us to trace the path of the different services and microservices that are serving up an individual request. And uh, we can use that to profile and uh, monitor those microservices based apps, locate failures and locate you know, slowdowns and improve performance. So uh, I mentioned that we were selling coffee and pastry from our app. And so uh, what we're gonna do here is we're going to look at the Lambda function that serves up the pastry. And to do this, what we're going to do uh, when we go back into the environment is we're going to click the new button again. Uh, and we're, this time we're gonna select traces instead of the Explorer view. And once we've done that, we're gonna filter on uh, just those Lambda services that are serving up our pastry component, because we want to check the health of, uh, of this new feature we've added to the app to make sure that it's working properly. <clears throat> uh, this will allow us to then bring up the actual uh, spans and see the Lambda spans as well as the front end spans. And once we do that, then we'll be able to sort of investigate and see what those, you know, what those spans are telling us. So same environment, um, same login. I, I'm not gonna uh, spend a lot of time here since we've already logged in once. Again, there should be a PDF available for you. And then let's switch back over to the environment. The first thing that we have to do, uh, I'm gonna go ahead and close these other tabs out. So I'll right click and say, close all tabs. Uh, so we're back to a fresh new screen and I'm going to click the new button. And this time we're going to choose traces. When uh, we click traces, the traces tab comes up and now we have a selection of different traces that we can, uh, we can see. You see that the traces matches, uh, matches a query. We have no query, so it's showing us everything. We want to filter this out a little bit. And so we're going to click into this filter section. Uh, it is possible to type in this box, but I'm going to do this entirely by clicking. So I'm going to click on service. I'm going to click on the equals, and then I'm gonna scroll down and find the first of our two Lambda functions for the, the pastry. So check sweets function. And then I'm finally gonna click, click for any span. So this will apply a filter, but we wanna do one more. So I'm gonna click again. I'm gonna say service equals, Sweets function this time. So the other Lambda function that is part of our pastry service. And again, for any span. So what this is telling us is there's an invisible or here. So we're saying show us anything that contains this function or this function, this service or this service. And there's still quite a few of them. Uh, I'm gonna go ahead since I'm trying to sort of identify whether or not this is working and just doing a health check on this. I'm gonna go ahead and filter by errors because if there's gonna be a problem, it's probably gonna be in one of these high error traces. Uh, and then once I have one of these set up, I'm just gonna, or at the top of the screen, I'm just gonna go ahead and click on this uh, duration breakdown section. And when I click on it, I will get the trace for this uh, particular um, invocation. And there's a lot of things uh, available here to see, uh, you can see a lot, all of the front end um, traces, which are up here at the top. And in fact, there is a problem here on the front end. Uh, you, can, you can follow along, these red lines indicate a problem and you can drill down all the way down to this one, which shows us that uh, it appears that our coffee service uh, get beans operation failed. Uh, and so that is a, a problem, but we're not really here to test the front end and to check the front end today. What we're here to look at is the back end. And so that is this Lambda handler. Um, and so we have the trace for that available here as well. And if I click on this trace, we can see that it took 133 milliseconds. Uh, if I click on it, I'm gonna bring up a context sensitive menu over on the right hand side. And this, I'm, I can see some information about this specific um, trace and I can see, uh, you know, uh, times that it was started and, and ended and that sort of thing. But I can also come over here to the entities section and I can look at the various entities associated with this. 
Uh, and so you can see that we have, you know, uh, some information available up here for the overall function. Uh, we can look at the coffee bar app it's, uh, as an entity and see uh, the latency and some st statistics about this, the number of errors. Uh, but we can also look at this very specific uh, Lambda function name down here, which is this TCB training Lambda suites function with the, with the nice uh, gobbledygook at the end of it. Uh, and this will give us um, some additional information. So the number of invocations, et cetera. So there's different sort of ways to slice and dice this. This is the one that we're gonna focus on though. And we're gonna click open in entity dashboard. And when we click the open in for this one, so this is, you need to specifically look at the training Lambda suites function uh, with, the, with the 96 or whatever, whichever one you clicked on. Uh, when you click an open in <clears throat> entity dashboard, this will bring up a dashboard for this particular function. And what it's going to do is it's going to let us get some additional historical information around this function. And we can see from this dashboard that the performance, there have been a few uh, hills and valleys, but in general, the performance seems to be fairly standard and, 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 and not, not that uh, erratic. So it looks like we're doing pretty well. It looks like the function duration is doing pretty well. There are other dashboards that we can look at for this particular uh, function. Uh, so we can look at you know um, resource usage if we uh, like. So if I click on resource usage, then we can see that over time, you know, the memory size and the memory used has remained fairly constant. Uh, I can see that the durations varies a little bit depending on some other factor, uh, but you know, overall the success rate is, is pretty good and we haven't had uh, too many errors. So it looks like our newly added service um, in the form of our, our pastry shop and, and the underlying Lambda functions that service those um, are, are doing pretty well. So uh, no fire here, uh, just a, a, a successful health check of the environment. And <clears throat> that's uh, the second workshop. So let's again, recap very quickly. What do we do? Um, you know, we leverage tracing to highlight or to investigate any particular, any potential performance issues that were um, cropping up for our Lambda service. Um, we filtered on the views of the different um, traces and picked some that were specific to these Lambda invocations and, and that had, you know, higher error rates. Uh, and then we brought up the span view uh, and sort of dug into to those spans uh, or to those, those specific traces to see, uh, um, you know, if there was a problem. And, and in fact, there wasn't. So what are the next steps uh, past that, past this workshop? Well, there are some other classes available. There is an observability admin class. So if you have interest in learning how to set this up, um, we offer uh, a CloudFormation template uh, for setting this up for quite easily. It also integrates with Control Tower uh, so that you can um, have an automated uh, automated provisioning process for, you know, data ingestion as part of, uh, as part of your control tower, um, you know, uh, integration so that when you provision new, new accounts, uh, they're automatically included in this observability function. Um, we also teach how to configure and deploy, uh, custom Kubernetes clusters. So we did sort of hinted some of that today. We was not the object of this workshop, but, but that is a, a, a fully featured, uh, observability uh, capability that we have um, that's distinct from, from the AWS. And then also um, for setting up tracing points using the open telemetry uh, agent that is available. So if you would have any interest in, in taking that class, um, you certainly um, it's a, it, you know, it's available and, and uh, you might want to look into that. You can also um, read about these solutions online uh, at sumologic.com. Uh, these links, uh, I think maybe we can put in the chat for you so that you can click on them if you wanna learn more, um, or you can just you know search for observability in Google, so observability in Sumologic and then they should come up. 
Uh, and with that, that is the end of the um, scripted portion. We have a few minutes left, and we're happy to take any questions. Uh, if you have some, um, you're welcome to either type them into the chat, or you can uh, unmute uh, yourself and ask them verbally, although we'd ask that you be respectful and not conflict with each other. I have a question about this stuff for the, um, I'm looking at like my company's install and mm -hmm. I see we have observability turned on for lambdas, but whenever I go to like the uh, lambdas, I see install Kubernetes, install AWS or install tracing app. Does that just mean we need to install the tracing layers in our lambdas or what does that mean we need to do next? Uh, that's a great question. Rishi, do you, do you know how that, how that works? Yeah, sure, sure. And uh, just so I understand, this is on the uh, Explore tab, right? When you open the Explore tab? Yes, because, yeah. yeah, the only thing I see are those three install things. Oh, okay, okay. And you you don't see a, a section for AWS Observability? Well, no, I see like AWS, I'm on a Observability, AWS Lambda. And on my app, my choices are install Kubernetes app, install AWS app, or install tracing app. Understood, understood. So basically your AWS observability solution hasn't been set up and uh, you can just work with your Sumo admin to, uh, to get that done, right? And if you actually, if you look at the links in the chat, these links point you how to deploy the AWS observability solution to get that, uh, that kind of view. Okay, thank you. Sure. Rishi, we have another question in chat from Jeff and Jeff, you'll have to tell me, is that Dininger or Dininger? It's Dininger. Thank you. Um, and Rishi, it's about how observability is licensed. Sure, sure. So observability is just based on your um, on your ingest. So we charge by um, uh, log ingest, metrics ingest, and then tracing has its uh, and and tracing ingest as well. So if you go to our pricing page, and I can paste the link in the chat, that will show you. Um, there's no like a, a separate license uh, per se for observability. We have enterprise plans, but um, observability capabilities themselves are uh, licensed based on the ingest, right? I'm gonna just paste the link in the chat and you need to be on the Sumo Logic credits model to uh, take advantage of some capabilities like tracing. Okay. Does that answer your question, Jeff? It does, thank you. Sure. All right, any, uh, any other questions? If not, um, you're welcome to leave. And we wanna thank you so much for joining this session uh, and learning a little bit about Lambda and how Sumo Logic uh, works with Lambda to accelerate uh, performance and outage investigations. Thank you.